Robert Silverberg is an American writer. Born in 1935 to a pair of Jewish parents in Brooklyn, Silverberg studied at Columbia University. He received a BA in English Literature in 1956. That same year he married Barbara Brown, but the two would separate by 1976. After taking a decade to get divorced, Silverberg would then marry Karen Haber in 1987. Silverberg would begin his writing by submitting stories to Fantastic Magazine as well as contributing to other magazines and the so-called Ace Doubles, paperbacks containing two books in one. Silverberg wrote voluminously and is credited by Lee Child at one point to have been writing about 250,000 words a month, writing many award-winning science fiction novels. To date, he has won four Hugo Awards and six Nebula Awards, as well as saw himself inducted into the Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame in 1999. He moved to the East Coast in 1972 and retired from writing in 1975, a promise he has largely upheld, aside from briefly returning to the craft in the 1980s. Gilgamesh the King was published in 1984 and is somewhat at odds with Silverberg's usual or at least most well-known output. The book narrates the early life, youth, and ascension to the throne of Uruk by Gilgamesh, as well as his meeting with Enkidu, the battle with the Bull of Heaven, the lengthy expedition to the Cedar Forest, and him constantly fighting to thwart the machinations of the Inanna priestess of Uruk, who wishes to manipulate him to her own ends. This very nearly is the type of book I was looking for for years, a story taking place in ancient Mesopotamia unblemished with the holier-than-thou attitude of biblical prophets. It is sad that this is such a rarity, at least it was until relatively recently. The background for the story is rich and is very well executed, perhaps only the fact that the amount of God Silverberg's names at times is rather small, though of course that may have been something to do with trying to put oneself into the mindset of a man of the 25th century BC before the growth of an expansion of the religious landscape in succeeding centuries. That would be probably one of the only explanations I can think of for invoking such a small amount of deities considering the sheer unbridled amount of them in existence in Mesopotamia, even at the time. There is also understandably some inconsistency with more modern interpretation of the mythology in ancient texts, but considering the fact that the sources used for the, if cited at all, were at least ones from around the 1950s, these are also completely excusable. However, there is one thing I cannot forgive Silverberg for having done, and that is to reduce all the genuine supernatural trappings of the original myth down to visions and ecstatic possessions. Worst of all, he reduces Humbaba, the one called a battering ram in some of the earlier translations, the one I assume Silverberg must have himself been using, into nothing more than a cloud of smoke, and the bull of heaven into nothing more than a mere runaway bull that is said to have the essence of the real thing in it. The former pains me especially as I have always since my earliest childhood been fascinated by giants and though the Greeks have more than you can shake a stick at, I would have loved to see how this would have been handled in a less realistic fashion. The setup until the moment when it is revealed that Humbaba is supposedly only a column of smoke is really tense and leaves you on the edge of your seat but the reward is rather disappointing. There is also the Flood story, which is scaled down a peg where Zeusudra is now not even an immortal, but is instead just one of a series of people holding the same title over time. Oddly enough, Silverberg wrote a sequel of sorts for the book, with Gilgamesh in the Outback, which includes stories with his character Gilgamesh encountering other characters, including Picasso in the afterlife. And you have to wonder why he couldn't have just went along with it for the original story.